Good morning. Good morning. The Lord be with you. And also with you, thank you. So this is the end of Lutheran Schools Week, as it is uh, always an anticipated uh, week for our students. And they had a great time this week. Lots of cool things happen, fun activities, but also a couple servant uh, event things. We uh, made some cards, took them around to some of our public servants, and they were appreciative to get them. So it was really a, a neat week. You may not know this, uh, but a couple of things about Lutheran schools. You know, when, when the West was being settled, that includes Wisconsin, it was not uncommon for a group of Lutherans to establish a school first, and then the church was, uh, would come after it, after we, they had the school started, because Lutherans always, uh, in the, really the tradition of Martin Luther, uh, believed in the education, you bet. And uh, in fact, Luther uh, was an advocate for educating girls back in the 16th century. That just didn't happen. Boys might be educated, but not girls. But he advocated that every child should learn uh, really about God. Ten Commandments, Apostles' Creed, that's the, the small catechism that many of us used in our confirmation. So, uh, so ironically, uh, public schools uh, really can trace their origin back to the Reformation time. So Luther was a catalyst for uh, all children being educated. And uh, yeah, so that's pretty cool. So it's, it's fitting that we celebrate Lutheran Schools Week, and it was, uh, it was really a, a, a wonderful week. So uh, the theme for our school year and of Lutheran Schools Week was, or is, making, make, uh, making disciples for life. Right? So today, uh, as we culminate this uh, Lutheran Schools Week, our sermon today is on discipleship. Yeah, what is, what is that? I mean, it sounds like a pretty important, significant thing. And so we'll unpack that a little bit using the words of Jesus. All right? So uh, uh, would you please pray with me as we begin our, our, our message today? O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all of the earth. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Army Sergeant Nathan Bouchard was with the uh, 3rd Battalion, 3rd Infantry Division out of Fort Stewart, Georgia. He ended up serving in Iraqi, or I mean in Iraq, in Iraqi, uh, uh, how come I can't say it? Uh, Operation Iraqi Freedom. There you go. And uh, yeah, so, but in high school, uh, Nathan Bouchard was known by his football coach anyway as the little bulldog. He was five foot, five inches tall, 135 pounds soaking wet, but he had, as the coaches would say these days, a high motor. Uh, he was a linebacker, so he was always getting into the back, uh, backfield, just causing havoc for, um, for offenses. And, you know, his neighbors talked about him, just never in a bad mood, never had a bad day. He, uh, uh, he grew up in California, so he was constantly on the move, mountain biking and surfing, hiking, uh, playing hoops with his buddies. And yeah, that's how he uh, operated uh, his, his life. So uh, Nathan uh, Bouchard uh, would do something very interesting when he would write home to his parents. Now, it's sad to say that in Samara on August 18, 2005, uh, a roadside bomb uh, took Nathan Bouchard's life. And, and so his legacy lives on a little bit in part due to what he wrote on his letters home to his parents. He, he included three Latin words, essa quam verde, which if you translate it, means to be rather than to seem. To be rather than to seem. He had a friend named uh, Bipsy. He wrote this about Nathan Bouchard. I met Nathan when we were in drama together at Mount 
San Joaquinto, and I also knew him through our Christian college group, The Fold. My favorite memory is this. He called me at 3 in the morning and said, Bipsy, I'm joining the Army tomorrow. Let's go to the beach right now. <laughs> so we drove to Oceanside, went all the way out to the edge of the pier, and he said, you got to try this. Sit on the edge. It was pitch black. I was a little scared, but he was right. It was awesome. All you could see were the seagull's white bodies and the reflections shining on the black, glassy water. It was surreal, like floating in space. I only saw Nathan one more time after that before he died. I'm so thankful to God that I got to have that special memory of someone so in love with life. He knew how to live it with passion and died fighting for what he believed. Nathan Bouchard lived life fully engaged with it passionately. He took on hard things and experienced everything he possibly could to be rather than to seem. It means, it means not just talking about doing something, but doing. It means not just uh, creating an image, but creating. Not, not just pretending, but participating. Reminds me of the two beavers that were standing on Hoover Dam. And one said to the other, well, I didn't build it, but it's based on an idea of mine. Oh, man, this is a tough crowd this morning. Holy moly. <laughs> Whew. A little bit of a joke there. <laughs> Apparently not very funny, though. To be rather than to seem fits very well in the Christian's call to follow Jesus. And so our theme today is to truly follow Jesus is to be rather than to seem. So how does that look in our Christian lives? Can we look at ourselves and say, well, am I... Am, am I engaging as a Christian, as a disciple of Jesus, or do I just seem to? I mean, how do people know that you're a Christian? Huh? I mean, sure, I mean, some people, your neighbors and friends, well, I think they go over to peace. But how do they know according to your actions and words? Is it more of just an image? Or is it how you live your life that reflects Jesus? Uh, think of a day when you're kind of tired and frustrated. H how do you treat the, the person at the cash register or a, a customer service representative? How often do you talk about Jesus with, with friends? How often do you have spiritual conversations? And you parents and grandparents, how often do you tell your, talk about Jesus with your, with your children and your grandchildren? Look, if parents don't teach and educate their children about Jesus, the culture will be happy to teach them all kinds of things that are patently not about Christ. We are following Jesus when we make disciples by teaching. I mean, you yourselves, how... How much time do you spend reading the Bible? Most of us have a Bible at least somewhere handy. How often do we open it up and spend some time learning about our Savior Jesus, reading the Gospels? Yeah. So I did you know, just a little bit of research, and I know I'm, I'm a little bit of an outsider. I live in the big city of Lily. And, uh, and so just checking... Uh, here at Peace, we have about 1,100 members uh, baptized. Uh, we worship about 250, which is a little below the average. Uh, and then I checked out, well, how many people gather weekly to study the scriptures and to talk about it? Uh, generously, 60, 65. That's pathetic. So there may be a lot of seeming going on rather than be. 
And that brings us to our text, where Jesus has hard words to say. Yeah. Uh, leave it up to Jesus to say something kind of difficult to understand, right? I mean, I get that. But when we look at it, it, it sort of becomes clear. He says, if you're going to follow me, deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. Now, we actually pray that in the Lord's Prayer. Yeah? Every, every time we gather for wor worship, yeah, yeah. thy kingdom come, thy what? Will be done on earth with us as it is in heaven. Yeah, we pray. So what it means to deny yourself, take up your cross and follow Jesus means to put God's will ahead of our own. That's what it means. To do what God would have us do, not the way that we want to live our life. Yeah. And, and, you know, Jesus had some chilling words to say earlier in Matthew uh, it's recorded where he says, not everyone who calls to me Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, uh, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven will enter. So how did Jesus do this? So Jesus doesn't ask us to do anything that he hasn't done already. And you know this. When Jesus was praying the night before, the night he was actually betrayed, uh, he's praying in Gethsemane, and he prays to, to the Father, he says, may this cup pass from me. Meaning he didn't want to have to go through what he was going to have to go through on the cross. And then he prayed, but not my will, but yours be done. Putting God's will ahead of our own. And if you do read the Gospels, you see that's Jesus, how he lived his life. Think of, think of the mercy and the grace and the love that he shared with all kinds of people that we might consider undesirable. Yeah. In, in John 4, he uh, was in the region of Samaria, right? And Samaritans and Jews, you know, they, they didn't get along very well. It's like Bears fans and Packer fans. They just don't get along very well. I'm a Vikings fan. Everybody loves us, so I mean that's not a deal. But <laughs> I had a couple of people coming out shaking their heads last night about that. Yeah. But in all seriousness, Jesus engaged this woman who was an adulteress. She had had five husbands, and the guy he was, she was with then wasn't her husband. But he didn't judge her at that moment. Rather, he taught her and he, he explained worship to her. And and pretty soon, all of a sudden. Because of the Holy Spirit's work in her life, she, she believed in Jesus. And she ran back into town and said, you've got to come and meet this guy. And then the town comes out and they start talking with Jesus. And they say, stay with us and people will be in heaven when we get there. Because that woman made disciples. That she lived the way that Jesus taught her. So with love and grace, Jesus spent time with her, not judging her. Uh, a little bit later in John, he, uh, he befriends the woman caught in the act of adultery. Yeah, and yeah, he says, who, who are they that, uh, that condemn you? And she says, no one, sir. And he says, well, then, then neither do I condemn you. Go and leave your life of sin. Jesus always met people where they were with grace and patience. Think of the hated Roman centurion. I mean, Rome was occupying Israel and they hated the Romans. And yet this Roman centurion, this officer, comes to Jesus and says, can you please heal my servant? And Jesus engages this guy, this hated centurion, engages this guy in conversation, and then all of a sudden he says, I haven't found such great faith even in Israel. Jesus connected with people that were outsiders. He was always concerned about the other. And that means you. And that means me. We are Gentiles. And, I mean, think of the patience that Jesus has for you. Think of the patience. I, 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 when we do our confession, as Bryce led us through confession of sin, I mean, I... I just, I'm sick to my stomach sometimes thinking of the ways that I have rebelled against God. And yet his gracious forgiveness comes to me 
and comes to you. You see, Jesus ultimately denied himself and took up the cross, literally. That lonely walk to Calvary, Jesus walked because he desperately wants you in heaven with him. He paid that high cost of sin, and it cost him his life, and yet he willingly went through it so that you and I would enjoy the marriage feast of the Lamb in heaven which has no end. God has had mercy on you through Jesus Christ. He has done that for you, and he'll never leave you, and he'll never forsake you. And he says, follow me. Deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. So what does that exactly mean? What does that, I mean, it's all fine to talk about this religious stuff. What does that mean in real life, right? How, how does that look? Now, what does it mean to deny yourself, take up the cross and follow? Well, I, you know, it's, it's one of these where it's just uh, sometimes it's a notion in your head or in your heart, sort of a niggling that I need to help in this situation. I need to support this, this person. I, I need to go out of my way and sacrifice my will, even though I don't really have time and I'm kind of tired uh, we can come up with all kinds of excuses, but, but God calls us to bear a cross, and he, he gives us those, and typically they're people. Yeah? So maybe that means caring for a loved one or giving a ride to somebody on a regular basis that doesn't have a license. Yeah? Uh, maybe it means being patient with an egri. You know what an egri is? E-G-R-I, egri. Extra grace required individual. <laughs> My wife says I'm one of those. Yeah, I don't know. So I, I think the teachers would probably agree, right? Yeah, extra grace required. And maybe God is calling you to invest in that person. It's different for everyone, and there's no scientific kind of thing to follow. We just follow the Holy Spirit's leading us and guiding us and engaging to deny ourselves, take up our cross, and follow. To truly follow Jesus means to be rather than to see. So my challenge to you is exactly what Jesus challenges all of us. To not just pretend like we're a follower of Jesus, not just show an image of being a Christian, but actually sacrificing, denying ourselves, taking up our cross, and following. Because that's what Jesus did for us. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, guard our hearts and our minds, and keep them in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.